So welcome to today's webinar, Introducing Data on Information and Communication Technologies. I'm Mark Rita. I work at the UK Data Service and I'm based in Manchester. And today I'm presenting with Cara Booker, a research fellow at the Institute for Social and Economic Research at the University of Essex. Right, before we start, just a couple of uh, things. So all attendees are muted throughout the webinar, so we won't be able to hear you. However, if you do have any comments or any questions, you can type them in the um, questions box, uh, which you should see on the GoToWebinar interface. Um, also on the interface, you should see a expandable menu called uh, Handouts. And I have uploaded a presentation in PDF format if any of you want to download it before the end of um, the presentation and wants to note on it or click on the links or so on, that's available to you. It should also be available on our website a couple of days from uh, today with the recording of the webinar if everything um, goes smoothly. Um, right, so before I start the actual presentation, I have a question for you, and I'm going to uh, launch a poll and just to check that everybody can hear me. Right, you should see it appear on screen now. Okay, most of you have, uh, have voted. Right, give it a couple more seconds, three, two, one. Oh, and as you can see, all of you can hear me, which is great. So the next slide is not necessary, fortunately. Right, so overview of today's webinar. I'm going to talk about some uh, data on information and communication technologies, and I'm going to show you how to search and find it on our website. Um, I'm also going to talk you through the supporting documentation and useful resources that the UK Data Service holds. And then Kara will talk about um, her research. So she will um, give an overview of the aim of the study, the data used, which is understanding society, uh, the methodology and the discussion. And at the end, we'll take your questions. Right, so information and communication technologies are reshaping the world, transform, transforming the way in which we communicate, work, manage crisis, do business, and even spend our free time. And these changes in turn uh, drive new policy development or less, uh, the societal impacts of digital technologies. So it's an important element of the social world, and there's lots of research uh, that's being conducted around this topic. Um, the UK Data Service holds uh, data on a wide range of uh, ICT topics, such as mobile communication, telework, social media, radio, television, internet use, mass media, security, trust, and so on. These key uh, research um, areas help you um, understand how the fast evolving world of digital technology um, impacts people's lives and communities. And uh, it also changes the way we interact. And that's why it is one of the key areas of interest um, for many social scientists. So many surveys collect data on information and communication technologies. But the information collected can vary. So the first task in the beginning uh, to research ICT is to search for a good source of data. And that's where the UK Data Service can help. So for those who are unfamiliar with the UK Data Service, we provide a single point of access to a wide range of social science data. If you're new to the service and want to know more about how to search and access our data holdings, you can find um, many video tutorials and uh, there's a link here at the bottom and especially if you've downloaded the slides, you'll be able to click on it. Right, just very quickly, um, let's talk about how to find and, and search for ICT related data on our website. So this is our homepage, uh, ukdataservice.ac.uk. And obviously you can type uh, a keyword in, uh, in our discover search box, or you can go through data types if you already know which uh, type of data you're looking for. So if it's census data, international data, longitudinal data, 
UK service or uh, so on. However, we do also have theme pages and information and communication technologies is one of the, um, the themes that we have them on. So let me just give you um, a short demonstration of these pages. So you get to them on our um, website, we're going to get data and then uh, data by theme. And this one is information and communication. So under the key data tab, so the first tab, you just find the list of um, main studies that we hold that are related to, um, to ICT. And you can see, for example, the British cohort study, British social attitude survey, community life survey, and so on. It gives you an idea of the coverage and of the topics. Um, these are only the main studies, it's important to remember. Um, so if you go onto the Discover search box or this Discover tab here, uh, there's links uh, to just all the range of studies related to information and communication, and uh, just also links to discovering um, other resources that we hold. Under the Analyzing tab, we've got some uh, video tutorials on how to visualize and analyze um, ICT data using our platforms, uh, for example, Nesta and UKDS.stat. Um, under research, we've got some examples um, of how data has been used in research, so our case studies. For the first one is uh, the research Kara is going to talk about later on. And then here, for example, we've got one about uh, broadband access um, in the UK. And then last but not least, we've got a tab on resources, uh, internal and external resources that could help um, researchers conducting um, research on ICT. Right, so back to the presentation. I just wanted to give you a few examples of kind, what kind of um, data statistics you'll find. So I just have some simple frequencies to show you. So for this one, I've used Nesta and the data set um, that it comes from is the Opinions and Lifestyle Survey, Internet access module, uh, January, February, and March 2014, and you can see that at the top. Um, and the question that um, has been asked to respondents is, uh, do you or anyone in your household have access to the internet at home by any device, regardless of whether it is used? And you can see uh, the percentage of people that uh, responded yes, for example, which is 83.6%. Uh, the percentage who said no, done no refusal, and then the valid cases, uh, the missing cases, and so on. So this is an example of what kind of, um, of variables you'd find. Um, and then I've got another um, example. This one comes from the Community Life Survey, 2014-2015. Um, and the question is, um, speak on the phone or video or audio call via the internet with family members or friends. Um, so they're asking, you know, if they have these phone or video calls um, more than once a day, once a day, two to three times per week, about once a week. Um, and I think these are really interesting statistics that you could find in surveys. And then my last example comes from the uh, World Bank World Development Indicators um, 2014. And it's about Internet users per 100 people, though of all countries. As you can see, I've left the first one out, the one in, uh, in pink, the 98.2%. And I've got another question for you. So I'll give you a couple more seconds to look at um, this bar chart. And then I'm going to ask you, um, what do you think uh, the first country then is? Um, let me just launch this poll. So which country had the highest number of internet users per 100 people in 2014, according to the um, World Bank. And let's see what you think. Right. You can see most of you have voted. Okay. Interesting results. Oh, I'll give it a couple more seconds. And now I'm going to close the poll. And let me share the results. 
Right, so 50% of you said Iceland, 4% of you said Latvia, 36% said China, 0% uh, said Italy, and 11% said Hawaii. And most of you uh, were right. So it is Iceland, and I'll show you in the next slide. So Iceland had the um, highest number of internet users uh, per 100 people in 2014. Well done to whoever said that. Right, and then before I hand over to Cara, I'd just like to talk to you about accessing and downloading the data from the UK Data Service. So access to our data uh, can come from different forms of license and access conditions. Um, the different access arrangements reflect the risk of potential disclosure. So all the data are anonymized, but if you had detailed information about, say, a person's job, which sector they work in, the area they live in, as well as the age and gender and other information, there's, of course, danger that in some cases you could identify who that person is. Um, most of our data is in the second category, so under the end user license, which only requires registration, so just a username and password. Um, however, we do also have more restricted data sets, um, which come under special license or secure access. Um, we've got a small number of open uh, data sets, some um, international data sets, for example, the OECD, um, IMF and World Bank data are open. Um, but as I said, if you're not registered with the UK Data Service, um, you should do so, and then you get access to most of our data. Um, so other resources and support we offer, so we have webinars, <laughs> as this one, um, they do talk about research, um, they talk about data types, um, we also have webinars on um, particular software, so you can see all of those on our events pages, and we've also got face-to-face -face workshops. Um, we have guides and video tutorials on different topics, data, th uh, data sets and methods. Um, case studies that showcase how researchers have used um, data. And then we have help. So we have a dedicated help desk, um, and we usually get back to our users within a couple of days. Um, and there's also some very useful FAQs. And you can join our mailing list if you'd like uh, to know what's happening in the service. Uh, you can sign up to get our newsletter, which is quarterly. And then we're on Twitter, like Understanding Societies, and we're on Facebook. And now let me hand over to um, Cara, who is going to talk to you about her research um, on screen-based media and youth well-being. Okay, hello, and thank you for um, attending this webinar. Um, as Margarita said, I'm going to talk to, about, talk to you about screen-based media use and youth well-being. Um, so a recent Ofcom report published um, now a couple years ago um, looked at technology and social media use among UK children and adolescents. And they found that 80% of um, adolescents 12 to, 15 year old, 12 to 15 years old regularly viewed television. 69% um, of them used a mobile phone, 49% had a PC or laptop that they used, and 43% used a tablet. And among this same age group, we see that 71% use social networking sites regularly. Um, and the most popular site, um, which they had a profile on, was Facebook. Although um, many of them had a profiling site on Facebook, most of them used other social networking, such as Instagram or Twitter, more often. Um, and something of note that I thought was interesting was that only 20% or 20 of 8 to 11-year-olds also have a social networking profile. So you can see that this starts young, either with parents putting their children up there so they can share um, with their friends or with other family members, and then it increases as they get older. And just as a comparison, 80% um, of 35 to 44-year-olds have a social, or new social, um, social networking sites. Um, and among this age group, 78% use them daily, as compared to 92% of 
24 to 34 year olds who use a social networking site daily. Um, and what we're really interested in to look at is whether these are, whether social networking is related in any way to adolescents' happiness. Um, so in another report by the Good Childhood um, report, which is put out by the Children's Society and the University of York in 2014, used a variety of data, including understanding society, to look at well-being and happiness among children in the UK. And what they found was that year six and eight children rated their overall life satisfaction as 8.5 out of 10. So you can see that satisfaction is fairly high among these children. And again, with happiness, their happiness is quite high, 8.6 8 out of 10. Um, there were differences by age, so younger children are happier than older children. So um, amongst, say, 10 to 15-year-olds, the 10-year-olds are going to be happier than the 15-year-olds. And boys are typically um, report higher levels of happiness than girls. And then when they looked at trends over um, several years, from 2000 to 2008, they found that among 11 to 15 year olds, happiness increased. Um, however, starting in 2009, the level of happiness decreased and it hasn't really gone back up to the 2000-2008 levels. Now there's a few um, reasons for this. One is that in 2009, Understanding Society started, so it could be a slightly different um, sample that was used compared to 2000 to 2008, which was more British Household Panel. It could also be a reflection of the economic changes that was going on um, between 2008 and 2009. What was consistent, however, were that boys were consistently had higher levels of happiness than girls. Um, although when you look at different domains of happiness, for example, um, satisfaction with school, girls were more satisfied than boys. Um, but the biggest difference was that boys were consistently happier with their appearance than girls. And this, this is a trend that has been getting wider over time and not narrow. So our research questions um, is what is the pattern of screen-based media use among UK young people and is screen-based media use associated with well-being in the same population? So we used Understanding Society, which is a successor to the British Household Panel Survey. Um, British Household Panel Survey members were included in Understanding Society starting from Wave 2. So we do have some people who have been in the study or have been um, in both the British Household Panel Survey and now Understanding Society since 1991. It's an annual household survey in which we aim to interview all adults 16 years old um, and older in the household and all young people 10 to 15 years old. And then when those 15-year-olds 15 15 turn 16, they become part of the adult panel. Um, it was representative of the United Kingdom population in 2009. It's comprised of four subsamples. Um, and one of those subsamples is an ethnic minority boost. Um, I will just be using the general population sample. There's also a comparison sample for the ethnic minority boost and an innovation panel um, subsample. At wave one, which was um, in 2009, 2010, um, there were over 100,000 individuals and 40,000 households who were interviewed across um, three of those four samples. Um, some questions are asked annually and others are asked on a rotating basis and I will explain a little bit more about that um, when we come to the questions that I used. So the youth panel of Understanding Society, as I said, is given to young people 10 to 15 years old. It's a paper and pen questionnaire that they are given while the adults are given their um, questionnaire. And um, the youth are um, usually given the questionnaire in a separate room than the adults in order to um, protect their confidentiality. Again, similar to the adult interview, there are some questions that are asked annually and some that are asked on rotating modules. At wave one, there were just under 5,000 young people who completed the questionnaire and a little bit more than half of them were male. 
Um, currently, five ways of data are available on um, in, from the UK Data Service, and it has just over 10,000 young people across the five ways who have uh, participated in this youth panel. So we looked at the following questions. Um, hours spent on playing computer, computer games on a school day, um, whether they use the internet for playing computer games, playing games on a games console, chatting on social networking sites such as Facebook, um, and watching television. And we also have questions on happiness. Um, we have six questions and we added those together. And then we looked at the um, top 10%, those who scored in the top 10%. Um, we also used the Strength and Difficulties Questionnaire, which is a questionnaire that um, assesses uh, young people's emotional difficulties. And again, we looked at the top 10%. So we looked at those who had um, particularly low well-being as compared to um, those with um, no, fewer problems or fewer problem behaviors. So first we looked at who spends more time on these activities, whether boys or girls spent a um, different amount of time, whether younger or older um, adolescents spent different amount of times doing different activities. And what you can see from this um, figure is that there is no difference in computer games between genders. Um, however, older adolescents, so 13 to 15, played more computer games than those who are 10 to 12. Um, not surprisingly, you see that boys play more games on a console than girls. And here, kind of the opposite of what we find earlier, um, younger people play on a games console. Um, girls tend to watch television and chat on social networking sites more than boys. Um, older adolescents use social networking sites more than um, younger adolescents. Again, not surprising seeing that some of these social networking sites do have an age limit at which you cannot join if you're too young. Um, and there are no differences by age for watching television. And then looking to see if these activities are related to happiness, we looked at um, compared to those adolescents who reported doing any of these activities less than one hour a day. We looked at those who did activities one to three hours per day or four or more hours per day. And this is during a school, your typical school day. So these kids are in school. So if they're doing any of these activities four or more hours per day, it's quite a bit. Um, and as you can see, those who um, played on computer games one to three hours a day were less happy. Um, but no association between those playing four or more hours a day. And that might be just because there were very few, um, few adolescents reporting playing four or more hours a day. Um, you see the games consoles really, there was no um, significantly higher association between being less happy or more happy um, between kids who play less than one hour a day, reported playing games consoles less than one hour a day, and those who played more. We do see that um, social networking um, was associated be with being less happy for those um, adolescents who reported, or reported chatting for one to three hours per day as compared to those who chatted less than one hour a day. Um, there is no association for the lower amount of um, watching television compared to those who watched the least amount, but there was for um, those adolescents who reported watching TV for more hours per day were less happy than those who reported watching television for less than one hour per day. And then going on and looking at socio-emotional difficulties, so we're kind of now looking at the um, low well-being part of the scale, um, we see different patterns here. So we see no associations for any um, amount of playing computer games, but we do see um, a, those who played games consoles pretty much more than one hour a day had more difficulties compared to those who played, reported playing games consoles for less than an hour a day. 
And unlike what we saw with um, social networking sites and happiness, we don't see an association for the moderate amount of social networking sites. So that from one to three hours, but we see those uh, adolescents who reported being on social networking sites for four or more hours per day had more difficulties. And here we see no association with television where we did see a slight association um, with happiness. So from this um, research, we concluded that there were um, different patterns of social um, screen media use behavior by both gender and age, and there was an association between screen-based media use and well-being. However, these associations differed by type of screen-based media use and the measure of well-being. So we kind of wanted to look at this a bit more um, and look at changes over time. So this, the analysis that I just showed you was from wave one, and it was just looking at a snapshot. It was looking at associations um, right as the study was starting. And we wanted to, now that we have five waves of data, we wanted to look at changes over time and whether social networking use and happiness change with age among UK young people and whether these changes are related. And again, um, looking at initial levels of social networking use and looking at or happiness and seeing if they're related with changes in the other over time. So this is kind of the um, overall model. It's very busy, but I hope to um, be able to explain it to you quite quickly. So at the top, you have social networking use um, between ages 10 and 15, so as uh, adolescents get older, and we're going to look at their initial um, use, their level of initial use, that's the intercept, and then we're going to look at the slope, which is the change over time. And we do the same thing with happiness at the bottom. Um, and we look to see if there's any differences um, by child's gender, by parental marital status, by their parents' ethnicity, and their parents' highest education quality. So what I did do is just split these up by males and females because we saw at the beginning that males and females had higher levels of both social internet um, use and at levels of happiness. Um, and here it's just important to note that the top and the bottom, there's no arrows going from um, social internet, social uh, networking use and the intercept and happiness intercept or between the slopes or going across. So we do see that their um, adolescents um, increase their social networking use, males, over time and their happiness decreases over time but there's no association between those changes among males. And then among females we get the same patterns where social um, networking use increases over time, however it increases more than males, and we see that happiness decreases, and again, happiness decreases more than males. But here we see that there is an association between the social networking use at the beginning and happiness at the beginning, in which we see that um, there are lower levels of social, um, those with lower levels of social um, networking use are happier, or the converse, those who are happier use social networking less, um, and that we didn't see in boys. We can also see that um, girls whose mothers are Asian or other have, um, have lower, lo lower levels of social net um, use at the beginning, and um, Asian mothers, those with Asian mothers, um, use social networking less as they get older. So looking at some of the strengths and limitations of um, this study, um, it is one of the first longitudinal studies to look at the associations between social networking use and happiness among young people. And it was taken from a large nationally representative sample. Um, unfortunately, we don't have information on non-school use days. Um, and this is where looking at um, rotating modules versus annual modules come in. So they do ask about social networking use every year on the youth panel.
However, they only ask about non-school days or use on the weekends every other year. And so therefore, we weren't um, able to look at that. Um, we also don't ask about social networking use on other platforms, such as smartphones and tablets, which um, most of you know is a much more common way of um, adolescents accessing their social network these days. However, when the study was um, planned and started out in the field in 2009, smartphones and tablets were much less common. Um, and it's hard to get these changes into a study as big as understanding society so quickly. Um, we also do not know why they use social networking. So other than chatting for friends, which is what the question asks about, we don't know if they use social networking for other kinds of information. Um, or which sites are used, which specific sites are used. Do they use Facebook for family and Twitter for friends or um, Instagram for, for school friends and Pinterest for other types of friends? Um, we, aren't, we don't know this information. So we do want to look at non-school day use um, and all of the things I just said, use on different platforms, the reason why they're looking or using social networking apps, the quality of relationships with other users, or are they talking to friends that they actually know from school, or are they talking to friends that they met on these um, social networking sites, and the role of parents. Um, uh, policymakers, schools, and when, when they use them and how they're able to use um, these social networking sites. So quickly, I just want to acknowledge our funders from the ESRC who fund um, all of us, myself and my co-authors, uh, Professor Amanda Sacker and Yvonne Kelly, who are at UCL, and Dr. Alexander Skew, who's now at uh, British Airways. Um, there's more information. You can contact me, um, or you can contact anything um, about ICER from our newsletter. Um, we're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. Um, and that is me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you to Cara for presenting and our webinar and sharing um, all of this knowledge. Um, and have a good afternoon, everyone. <laughs>